So let's uh, kick off just with um, the presentation here. And just to go through our objectives for the day, we're going to be looking at stress. What is stress? What does it mean to you? Why are you concerned about it? Why are so many people concerned about stress? What impact does it have on the body? What impact does it have on our performance? And then we're going to be having a look at pressure and performance, the perf pressure and performance curve, uh, looking at how that stretches from boredom all the way through to, I suppose, what we could call chaos in our lives. And then why mindfulness can help us in terms of dealing with stress and pressure and helping us to perform, not just in terms of our work life, but in terms of finding a good work life balance and just being healthy overall. So, if I could then move on to what is mindfulness and various people have different perspectives of what mindfulness is and that can certainly range from something that is just uh, an eastern mystic religion through to something that maybe a few hippies practiced and having a look at why it has become such a mainstream issue and how it is helping people today. What is the science behind mindfulness? What did the researchers say? Why it can help and how it helps. And of course, how to apply mindfulness in your life to your professional life as well as to your personal life. And having a look at what some of the benefits of mindfulness will be. <clears throat> so, where did stress come from? Now, I think it's important to remember that we would not be able to survive without the body's inbuilt reaction, stress reaction, as we call it. And this function is located in the most primitive part of the brain what some people refer to as our reptilian or lizard brain, which is really just a metaphor for the amygdala, the part of the limbic system which is responsible for processing our emotions. It is this that helped Homo sapiens to survive. So you can imagine in the old days, many, many years ago, when there were such things as say were two tigers, and what would happen is that when we came across a saber-toothed tiger or one of them came across us, uh, a rather a frightening experience. And so the body went into stress. And it, that stress was primarily designed to help us get out of physical danger. When we feel threatened, uh, the part of our brain that we call the amygdala sets off an alarm bell which triggers the fight or flight response in our nervous system. And, you know, we can think of this as almost like a sort of smoke alarm. Um, it's detected that something's wrong. It sounds an alarm. Our blood is flooded with adrenaline and cortisol, which increases our heart rate and our blood pressure, as well as our respiration. And this allows us to transport oxygen to our muscles very quickly so that we can Act fast, instantly. While this heightened state once helped us with the physical threat of saber-toothed tigers and other things like woolly mammoths uh, that were wandering around our neighborhood, um, it does little to help us with today's stresses, which are predominantly worry, such as when we've hit the do not save on a Word document or you've sent an email to the wrong people um, or something rather like that. But the response that we have is still very much the same as if we were faced by the good old saber-toothed tiger. 
Now the problem is that when the body's stress reaction is out of kilter, okay, when it becomes overactive and responds to events, thoughts or feelings that are perceived as life-threatening, when in reality they are not life-threatening. Okay, it's very, very rare that by sending a, an email to the wrong person, uh, or we're going to almost be terminated in our lives. It might be a bit of a challenging environment that we face, but you know, the key word is perceived. It's the perceived danger. And if we can change the way we perceive what is happening, we can change our experience of what is happening. And this is a fundamental theme that flows through the next two hours. It's changing perceptions of what is happening and how can we change the way we perceive things. Now, stress, as I mentioned earlier, stops the normal functioning of our body. The body assumes that there's a physical threat in the immediate vicinity so it channels energy into getting out of this immediate danger. To do this, it shuts down non-essential systems which are taking up energy, energy that might be used to run or hide, climb up a tree, whatever it takes. So what happens is it shuts down our digestive processes, our immune system, our growth and reproductive processes are inhibited. So. There's no time for eating or sex when we're being chased. I think that's fairly obvious. A bit of stress in small doses is useful in improving our memory and enhancing performance. However, too much, too regularly. So in other words, the ongoing stress of the daily job, maybe the commute to work, coming home late, dealing with the family, maybe studying all those types of things, that's regular constant stress. That never used to happen back in the old days. The saber-toothed tiger used to pop out of the woods every now and again. And we generally knew which areas not to go in order to avoid it. However, these days, stress seems to be something fairly unremitting. Now, too much stress is extremely damaging to our mental and physical well-being. Our bodies were just not designed for it. It can lead to things like stomach ulcers, heart problems, illnesses, lowered libido, and so on and so on and so on. Now, of course, meditation is something that actually changes the brain. And this helps deal with the mental effects of ongoing stress. And what has happened is that researchers have studied people who practice meditation regularly. And those people who do practice meditation regularly report feeling less stressed and more emotionally balanced. According to neuroscience, neuroscientists, if you continue to meditate, your brain physically changes even though you are not aware of it. Now, if we go to gym and we pump iron or get on the rowing machine, you will see that your body changes and it's something that is noticeable. And this is one of the challenges of meditation is that the brain physically changes, but it's difficult to notice. So we're going to come across this a little bit later and see how we can deal with that. So the brain, even though you're not aware of it, it is reshaping itself under conditions of meditation. Neuroscientists are also beginning to understand why meditation is effective for managing stress. Using brain imaging techniques, they've observed changes in the threat system of the brain. The response kicks off in the amygdala the part of the brain responsible for triggering fear. People who suffer from chronic anxiety have a more reactive amygdala, and this leaves them feeling threatened much of the time. And that, of course, is not a very happy situation to be in. 
Let's have a look at some of the modern stresses out there at the moment. And we can see, I'm sure, that some of these at least will be familiar to you. And so we have things like two careers per family. So husband and wife or husband and husband or wife and wife are working in order to support their children. We also have the single parent phenomenon where there's a single person who is trying to hold down a career in order to earn sufficient money to raise their children. And this has made all the more challenging with the high cost of childcare. Other modern stresses are the increased pace of work, the need for quick decisions. Everything is on the go. It's pressure, pressure, pressure. There's a significant fast and continuous change agenda. Everything coming in is new. There's new technology, the new ways of doing things. We have to change all the time. There are economic demands for us to work more effectively and efficiently to produce more with less. <clears throat> We're trying to learn new skills for our roles. We're studying at home to keep up to date. We've got role insecurity. We've heard about the gig economy, those types of things. And there are just an endless stream of competing demands and priorities on our lives. So let's have a look now at some of the stress warning signs that we can possibly get a bit of a deeper understanding of what stress is. So first of all, there are some symptoms and this is what a person feels like when they are under pressure. They have difficulty concentrating. They become indecisive or less able to make decisions, especially decisions that need instant answers. They tend to have memory lapses and make more errors of judgment. They're prone to outbursts of anger. They suffer from more anxiety, insecurity, moodiness, sensitivity, headaches, tension. They are tired, but they cannot relax. And quite often what happens then is that there is sleep deprivation. So some of the signs that you may observe in yourself or in other people are inconsistent performance on the job, inconsistent performance in terms of helping around the house, helping children with their homework, those types of things. We make uncharacteristic errors. We're not used to making errors, but when we are stressed and under pressure, we're more likely to make errors. Indecisiveness, as I mentioned earlier, our moods change, we are tired, irritable, we are, suffer from poor timekeeping, we're late for meetings, we're late to pick up children, we're late for this, we miss the train, we're absent from meetings or something like that. There's a lot of avoidance, um, possibly of social occasions, avoidance of things that we might deemed to be confrontational when in actual fact we should be addressing the issues, we overcompensate, have a loss of perspective, we worry about things, they become far bigger in our minds than they actually are. We have memory lapses and poor concentration, there's a resistance to change, we just want things to stay the same, to be stable in our lives. And that of course is so difficult these days because of the way things are changing. And of course, there might be changes in smoking, alcohol or eating patterns, smoke more, drink more, eat more, eat bad foods. So having gone through a bit of stress and what it looks like and what it feels like and how we can possibly detect it in people and in ourselves, let's have a look now at pressure and performance. And what we're going to be doing is having a look at the pressure performance curve. Just a quick introduction to the pressure performance curve and what it is. We'll be spending a little bit of time on this um, because it's, it's kind of important to where we're going. And <clears throat> just, 
I'm sure some of you would have seen it before, and it can take various forms. Sometimes it's a very simple sort of U-shape. This one the particular graph is uh, a little more intricate. And sometimes it's just broken down into three sectors. This particular graph is broken down into five sectors. But it's all very much the same concept at the end of the day. Okay, so the pre pressure performance curve, it demonstrates a positive correlation between pressure and performance up to a tipping point of diminishing returns. And that tipping point of diminishing returns, we can see that's kind of um, noted here as the zone of delusion, which is this spot just over here. And if I can get my pen to work, come on. Okay. Pen's not working at the moment. Come along, pen. Okay. So the zone of delusion, it's at the top right hand of the graph, and there's a little dotted line that's coming down to the very peak of the graph. So I hope you can all see that. Okay. So in other words, what it's saying is that up until that point, as pressure increases, so our performance increases. But once we get to that point, that peak, as the pressure increases, so our performance decreases. And you'll see that there's quite a rapid decrease in our ability to perform once we go past this zone of delusion, as it's known. So right on the very left-hand side, we start off with boredom. And that is when there is absolutely no pressure to perform. It's kind of almost like we're on holiday or we're in a, a stuck in some sort of a, a job that just has no goals, no targets. There's nothing to do, essentially. And there is no need to perform. So we'll probably just be sitting back at a, a desk, possibly feet up um, and reading the paper or something like that. That, of course, then increases as we move along to the right hand side. And we then end up in what is known as the comfort zone, where it's, I suppose, almost like a bit of a Goldilocks zone. There's just the right amount of pressure and there's just the right amount of performance and people feel very happy sitting in this particular zone here. The next zone in the orange is, is what's known as a stretch zone. And this is where performance is optimized. This is where we're performing at our absolute peak. And you'll see that there's a yellow line that oscillates between stretch and comfort. And that is where it's thought that it's best to perform sometimes in our comfort, sometimes in our stretch and sort of weaving in and out of both of them in order to keep performance at its maximum, but not straying over into the strain part of our zone. <clears throat> okay, many of us need pressure or deadlines to get things done. And what we need to do is find that balance between comfort and stretch. And this requires quite a high degree of self-awareness uh, in order to recognize when you're in that sort of envelope of stretch and when you are dipping into the strain section so that you can actually remove yourself, withdraw from that strain section, and you can get back on a course of optimal productivity and just the right amount of pressure. So what I'd like to just ask you now is, is you know, how, how does strain show up in you? Just, I would like you to take a minute to just consider how strain shows up in you from a physical perspective, 
You know, do you find that your heart rate increases, your pulse increases, your breathing maybe becomes more shallow? Um, what are some of the emotional indicators that you may have? Um, do you get moody? Do you get irritable? Does your anger tend to flare? You know, are you emotionally on a bit of a shorter leash when you're under pressure? Do you snap at people? And of course, you know, how, how does that show up in you mentally as well? So do you feel fatigue? Uh, and then what happens to you in terms of uh, spirituality or your belief system? Um, you know, do you feel overwhelmed and that uh, you just don't have the belief in the ability to go on? So just think about it in terms of I feel and just think about it for a minute. You may write some answers down if you have a piece of paper and a pen to hand. Okay, and then what I want you to do is just to contrast that with when you are not under strain. So how do you feel physically when you are not under excess pressure, when you're not working in, you know, the very end of the stretch um, curve, or you are, you've removed yourself from the strain situation? And you're not feeling overwhelmed, so you're not feeling exhausted. Um, just to give an example, quite often people fear public speaking, for example, and that puts them into a situation of strain um, and stress, and quite often they feel overwhelmed at making a public presentation. And in the lead up to that, so the level of pressure increases and increases and increases. And that's all fine and well, because you'll get to a point where you could actually maximize performance. But quite often what happens to people is that as that the final sort of countdown comes to doing that presentation, they end up in that zone of strain and sometimes feel overwhelmed, their performance then dips quite significantly and they lose their words, they lose their trains of thought and people who are quite often well-spoken uh, can stand up on stage and really not make much sense. Um, they forget people's names and I've seen this plenty of times before. Um, people introducing their, um, I'd like to introduce my um, my colleague because they've completely blanked out on that person's name. So just take a minute and think about how it feels when you move away, uh, you relieve yourself, maybe after a presentation, how do you feel? You know, it's such a relief. Um, your breathing's coming back. How do you feel physically? Uh, your shoulders might relax more emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, how does your mind feel? And then just, if you do have a pen and paper, you could write down something like, I feel. And so it is essential, you know, both personally and professionally to be able to recover from a strain. But importantly, I think it's great to be able to strategically recover from strain and being overwhelmed. And it's the strategically part where mindfulness comes in. 
And I think, you know, especially if you're uh, a leader as well, recognize when your employees are in strain, you have a duty to support their recovery from that strain session. So we have established that being in strain in, or overwhelmed is not good for you. It's not good for your organization. It's not good for your team. Uh, so how do you recover? Okay. And this is one of the things that we're going to be having a look at. But let's just for a moment consider an athlete. Okay. Do they play the whole game or do they take the bench? Okay. And what happens when they take the bench? Their heart rate, their respiration, blood pressure comes down and they recover their physical energy. They may also get a bit of a pep talk from their coach or a strategy talk and then, you know, get a desire to go back into the game. And that desire to get back into the game increases the longer they sit up. So it is with work. How many of us log on and start our day with little or no breaks? Like an athlete, we would perform better if we strategically took the bench or took a break, a time out, i.e. if we had some intentional recovery breaks throughout the day to sustain energy and engagement. This increases the likelihood of going home at the end of the day with energy rather than being completely depleted or exhausted. So ask yourself how much of that is in your control? Okay. Are you just going to wait for your manager to tell you to get up from the desk and go for a walk? How often does that happen? Have you ever seen that? Okay. Probably not. So in other words, it's up to you. And you need to ask yourself, what is stopping you? And of course, with breaks, we're going to have a look at how we can take them in a short period of time and how they can be significantly enhanced with a bit of mindfulness. Okay. Now, just reflecting back a little bit on the pref pressure performance curve, I want to ask you a question. When? Do you get your best ideas, your light bulb moments? Okay, just think about that. And in actual fact, most people, yeah, <laughs> I can see. Okay. Um, and yeah, most of the answers are during moments of recovery, when you're away from the workstation, away from the pressures, away from the stresses. And uh, I think it was Albert Einstein who said he got his best ideas while in the shower. Uh, if we all remember um, Archimedes, um, you know, he had his eureka moment in the bath of all places. And so, you know, this proves that the point that recovery brings out the best in our thinking, it enhances our productivity and our puts our brains into this amazing positive place and enhances creativity and solutions oriented thinking. However, as people, as human beings, we're just not very good at this, are we? Recovery is now seen as, you know, downtime, um, so if we see it as downtime, what it actually does, it allows you to have more uptime. Okay. Once again, think about the athlete on the bench. It is strategic recovery. Okay. So that's the pressure performance curve. And I'm just going to go back to recognize stress and strain signals. Because these are so important. These are the cues. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just some of the cues that will help you understand that you are in a position of stress or strain. So please, these are very important. When we start missing meetings and deadlines, we can't keep up with the schedule. We arrive late for meetings, arrive late for events. 
we work more from home. You know, the thing is we, we get home, we rush in the door. Uh, the first thing that happens is we go straight to the desk. We plonk down our PC or fire up the desktop and, and just uh, we just need to work for 15, 20 minutes. And a couple of hours later, we're still working. We're starving. Thing is now we're going to be eating late. Eating late is actually not really good for your sleep patterns. We may eat more than we need to eat because we're absolutely starving. There's a lack of willingness to socialize. Okay, we just want to stay indoors. We avoid people. Um, people become to us uh, a distraction in actual fact and a, a bit of a waste of time. We start missing lunches. We're unfocused, disorganized. Uh, quite often overcompensate for things and um, yet yeah, general avoidance in actual fact. So what I'd like you to do is to think about the last time you were in the comfort zone. Okay. What is it that you were doing at the time and what did it feel like? Think about a time when you were in the stretch zone. What were you doing at the time? And what did it feel like? These are the sensations and feelings you need to be aware of in order to manage your stress. So in other words, what did you feel like in the comfort zone? What did you feel like in the stretch zone? Understand those because those are cues. We'll often spend part of the day in stretch and part in comfort, maybe even boredom sometimes. But the zone we're looking for is where we're spending the majority of our time. So are you spending the majority of your time in the stretch zone? The best way to ensure you're healthy and balanced is to navigate the curve. And remember the yellow oscillating curve between comfort and stretch? Okay. Aim for time spent doing stretch activities balanced against the time spent in the comfort zone, recharging your batteries. Now, pressure and performance. Let's you know have a look at uh, an example. The England rugby team playing against the Georgian rugby team. For England, they will be in a zone of comfort. However, for the Georgian rugby team, they'll probably be in a bit of a strain or crisis zone. When England play Australia in rugby, it may be in a stretch. When England play back-to-back -back games with New Zealand and Wales, that too becomes a strain and crisis. Okay, so let's have a look at stress reaction. The parasympathetic nervous system, or PNS as we call it, is part of the autonomic nervous system. It does the opposite thing of the sympathetic nervous system, which is the other part of the autonomic nervous system. This way, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems balance each other's effects. The sympathetic nervous system helps a person fight, flight, or freeze when they are in danger. When the danger is gone, or we've managed to run away, or we've beaten it into the ground, the parasympathetic nervous system lets the person rest and digest, feed and breed. Okay. The parasympathetic nervous system has many different effects. It affects every part of the body, including the heart, so the heart relaxes and beats slower. This makes the heart rate and blood pressure lower. It affects the lungs. Breathing slows down. The bronchi, those are the little tubes that bring air to the lungs, also get narrower. The eyes, the pupils get smaller. The digestive system is affected because extra blood is now sent to the stomach and intestines. Those also work faster, and this helps a person digest the food in their stomach. 
Uh, blood vessels are also affected. So the blood vessels in the parts of the body that are far away from the heart, lungs, and brains get wider. This is called vasodilation. This helps make the blood pressure lower. It also makes the skin warmer and, well, you know, can cause a man to have an erection. The parasympathetic nervous system is controlled mostly by the vagus nerve. This is an important nerve that comes from the brain and stretches all the way down to the bottom of the spinal cord. The vagus nerve sends out chemical messengers called neurotransmitters, mostly one called acetylcholine. And this chemical causes change in many different parts of the body. <coughs> okay, so what happens in stressful situations is sometimes referred to as an amygdala hijack. Okay, and basically what happens here is amygdala hijack is an immediate overwhelming emotional response with a later realization that the response was inappropriately strong giving the, given the trigger. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Daniel Goleman, who's very well known for his work on emotional intelligence. He coined this term based on the work of a neuroscientist by the name of Joseph Ledon, who demonstrated that some emotional information travels directly from the thalamus to the amygdala without engaging the neocortex or higher brain regions. And this causes a strong emotional response that precedes more rational thought. Okay, so what on earth does that all mean? Well, the amygdala hijack basically equates to freaking out or seriously overreacting to an event in your life. So, for example, imagine you've been out shopping all day with um, your children. That's an experience in and of itself for those of you who have children. Or you may have observed unruly children in the shops. And at the end of the trip, the shopping trip with your children, you decide to go to the grocery store. As you walk through the produce section, one of your kids says, hey, look what I can do, and begins juggling three apples or throwing this, you know, throwing apples to each other. And, you, you know, the, the apples fall on the floor and you find yourself screaming and marching the kids out of the door, forgetting all your grocery shopping, what your goals were, what your intention was to do in the shops. And of course, on the car ride home, the kids are crying in the back, probably. Um, and you're, you know, you, you, you've managed to grip the steering wheel with such a ferocity that uh, it's quite surprising you didn't break it or you didn't melt it. But eventually, uh, you start to realize um, that your children were simply trying to demonstrate that they could catch, you know, that they are athletes or that they jugglers or something like that. And essentially, what they're doing is trying to show off. Uh, some skills, uh, have a little bit of fun, they're just being kids. And you realize that your angry response was unwarranted or at least certainly out of proportion to the situation. I mean, it's, you know, apples, you can pick them up off the floor, dust them off. Uh, if you feel really guilty about it, buy a couple of apples. Um, or if you don't feel guilty about it and the apples look in good condition, just put them back on the shelf. So you regret your hasty response and you apologize for reacting so poorly while reiterating that, you know, the kids shouldn't be throwing apples around the, the store because it might not be healthy for other people. Uh, they might damage the fruit. So the question becomes, then, why did you freak out in the first place? Well, basically, you had an amygdala hijack. Under normal circumstances, you process information through your neocortex or your thinking brain, where logic occurs. The neocortex then reroutes the information to your amygdala, a small organ, which lies deep at the center of your emotional brain. On occasion, there is a short circuit whereby the thinking brain is bypassed and signals are sent straight to the emotional brain. 
When this happens, you have an immediate overwhelming emotional response disproportionate to the original event. The information is later relayed to higher brain regions that perform logic and decision-making processes, causing you to realize the inappropriate creature, uh, Mr. Sabretooth again, who also happens to be out looking for a tasty snack. In this situation, your brain wastes absolutely no time in rational thinking. Bypass rational. Do not stop. Okay, straight to hijack. And thanks to that amygdala hijack, you would, you know, just be thrown into the flight or fight response. You're not going to freeze in front of the saber tooth tiger, that's for sure. So you're either going to try and fight it, you might have a spear. Uh, Otherwise, the best thing is try and get up a tree or run. I don't know whether saber tooth tigers climb trees, but anyway, hopefully you do survive to tell the story. And so it's hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution that have caused this short circuit, this amygdala hijack to actually happen. In modern life, of course, we are unlikely to encounter these huge, raving, bloodthirsty beasts uh, wandering around the streets of London or... Um, Manchester. Yes, even Manchester. We are, however, almost certain to encounter drivers that cut us off on the road, disrespectful colleagues, people who just blank you as they walk past you or walk into a room or you walk into a room, children that misbehave, and countless other situations that may well lead to the occasional amygdala hijack. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so with the amygdala, basically it's the brain's smoke detector. It sounds an alarm, releasing a cascade of chemicals, stress hormones. But conflict wreaks havoc on our brains. We are groomed by evolution to protect ourselves whenever we sense a threat. In our modern context, we don't fight like a badger with a coyote or run away like a rabbit from a fox. But our basic impulse to protect ourselves is automatic and unconscious. We have two amygdala, one on each side of the brain, behind the eyes and the optical nerves. Dr. Bessel van der Kork in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, calls this the brain's smoke detector. It's responsible for detecting fear, and preparing our body for an emergency response. When we perceive a threat, the amygdala sounds an alarm. And as I mentioned earlier, it releases a cascade of chemicals into the body. Stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol flood into our system, immediately preparing us for fight, flight, or freeze. When this deeply instinctive function takes over, we call it what Daniel Goleman coined in emotional intelligence as the amygdala hijack. In common psychological parlance, we say we've been triggered. <laughs> we notice immediate changes like an increased heart rate, sweaty palms, our breathing becomes more shallow and rapid as we take in more oxygen, preparing to bolt if we have to. Now, just bear in mind those cues, okay? Increased heart rate, sweaty palms, our breathing becomes more shallow and rapid. Okay, these are cues. So understanding these cues are very, very important in managing the situation. The flood of stress hormones create other sensations like a quivering in our solar plexus, our limbs, our voice. You may um, have you heard some people's voices go or quivery or, or uh, change pitch. We may notice heat flush our face, our throat constricts or the back of our neck tightens, and the jaw sets tight, or we clench our teeth, okay? And all we, all that's happening is that we are in the grip of a highly efficient, but nonetheless prehistoric set of physiological body responses. These are, sensations are not exactly pleasant, and they're certainly not meant for relaxation. They are designed to get us to move uh, into action quickly as possible. So the active amygdala <coughs> also immediately shuts down the neural pathway to our prefrontal cortex so we can become disoriented, 
in a heated conversation. And in a heated conversation, what happens? You may notice that your face flushes, your breathing becomes more shallow, you may have an increased pulse rate or sweaty palms, okay? Complex decision-making disappears. I'm sure we've been in these situations before, as does our access to multiple perspectives. As our attention narrows, we find ourselves trapped in the one perspective that makes us feel the most safe. I'm right, you are wrong, and we'll defend that to the death. Brexit, whoops, Remainer, ooh, I'm right, you're wrong. And even though we ordinarily see more perspectives, we get a very narrow, narrow perspective when we get our backup. And if that wasn't enough, our memory becomes untrustworthy as well. Yes, what did Boris say about the bus? Hmm. Have you ever been in a fight with your partner or a friend? Okay, and you literally can't remember a positive thing about them whatsoever. It's as though the brain drops the memory function altogether in an effort to survive the threat. When our memory is compromised like this, we really can't recall something from the past that might help us calm down. In actual fact, we can't remember much of anything. Instead, we're simply fooled with that flashing red light of the amygdala indicating danger, react, beep, danger, react, protect, danger, attack. So in the throes of the amygdala hijack, we can't choose how we want to react because the old protective mechanism and the nervous system does it for us, all automatic. Even before we glimpse that there could be a choice. Okay, and this is utterly ridiculous. So, how does mindfulness help? And can we practice mindfulness in conflict situations? And mindfulness is really just, it's the perfect awareness technique to employ when conflict arises. Okay, stress is conflict. Conflict is stress, whether it's work or at home. Mindfulness allows us to override the conditioned nervous system with conscious awareness. Instead of attacking or recoiling, going on the defensive, and later justifying our reactions, we can learn to stay present, participate in regulating our own nervous system, and eventually develop new, more free, and helpful ways of interacting, of controlling our environment. Practicing mindfulness in the middle of a conflict demands a willingness to stay present, to feel intensely, to override our negative thoughts, and to engage our breath to maintain presence within the body. Like any skill, it takes practice. There are different approaches to working with a provoked nervous system and intense emotions, but they all have some elements in common. So I'm going to start off with four simple steps that I try, <coughs> excuse me, that I try to use when I find myself with an overloaded nervous system and a body racing with a fight or flight impulse. Stay present. So that's the first step. Okay, the first step in practicing mindfulness when triggered is to notice we are provoked. So we look for the cue. What is it that notices or helps us to notice when we are provoked? And this might be the sweaty palms, the shallower breathing, the quicker breathing, feel what does it feel like for your jaw? How does your neck feel? How do your shoulders feel? What are your hands actually doing? Are they clenching? Are they tensing? Feel your fingers. And that'll give you a good idea of what it is that's happening to you and that you are possibly being provoked or you've entered into a stressful situation. Okay, uh, each of us has particular body and behavioral cues that, that are unique to us, but that all we share in terms of an overall commonality with the most of humanity. Okay, these cues alert us to the reality that we feel threatened, we perceive that we are threatened, and therefore are going to enter into an automatic pilot stage. We have to decide to stay put and present, to be curious, 
and explore our experience. What is happening to us? Explore that. For me, you know, it helps to remind myself to relax. When I'm worked up, uh, you know, sometimes I, I have the habit of looking away, possibly. Uh, feeling a slight sweat on my palms. Okay. And I just know then that I need to breathe. And the first thing I do is just take a breath. And I'm sure that you've heard the expression, just breathe or count to 10. Step two is just to, to let go of the story. Okay. And this, this could be the most challenging part of mindfulness we need to completely let go of the thinking and judging mind this is because when we feel threatened our mind immediately fills with all kinds of difficult thoughts and stories about what is happening that makes it challenging but we must be willing to forget the story just for a minute because there is a feedback loop between our thoughts and our body if the negative thoughts persist, so do the stressful hormones. It isn't that we're wrong, but we will be far more clear in our perceptions when the nervous system has relaxed. Step three is focus on the body. Now, simply focusing on feeling and exploring whatever sensations arise in the body. Feel them naturally, just as they are trying not to control or change them. Allow your mind to be as open as possible, noticing the different places in the body where sensations occur. What is tight? Your shoulders, your biceps, forearms, fingers. What is shaking? Do you, are your hands shaking? Are they trembling? Okay, can you feel blood rushing? Can you hear blood rushing through your ears maybe? Does anything hurt? We pay attention to the different qualities and textures of these sensations and the way things can change and shift in our bodies. Okay, and then step four, breathe. And we all know that it does help to breathe. There are many different qualities of the breath, but we only need to learn about two. Okay, it's rhythm and smoothness. To breathe rhythmically means to breathe in and out repeatedly at the same intervals. So there are a number of ways of counting. One, two, three, four, exhale. One, two, three, four, inhale. One, two, three, four, exhale. One, two, three, four, inhale. Establishing a rhythm, okay? Try and invite the breath to be even or smooth, meaning that the volume of breath stays consistent as it moves in and out. Okay, and if we pay attention to our body, it re-establishes our equilibrium faster. We get back to our position of calm a lot faster by paying attention to our body. It restores our ability to think, to listen and relate. We're going to be covering this in quite a bit more detail later. So, don't worry, this is just a, a little bit of a taster for all the sessions that are coming up. Anger becomes clarity and resolve. Sadness leads to compassion. Jealousy becomes fuel for change. Now, of course, this doesn't work all the time, and there are some times when we fail. But as we become more and more aware of our body's response to um, the hijacked nervous system, so we will become more and more masterful over what is happening in our lives and we can become happier, calmer, and a better person. Okay. Each time we succeed in being mindful of our body in moments of distress, we develop our capacity to handle the situation and ourselves better. Okay. A moment of pause, an unexpected question, when it appears or a laughter that erupts. Good. 
So let's have a look. Preventing the amygdala hijack. Knowing about it helps. So how do you use this in your life? Okay. <clears throat> it allows you to prevent it by remaining aware of your emotions during potentially triggering events. For example, if you spill a container of juice or one of your family knocks over a cup of coffee onto um, a freshly cleaned tablecloth or something like that, think carefully about the tremulous, the, sorry, the stimulus that is triggering your angry response. Recognizing that your daughter's action was a mistake, or your child's action was not on purpose, and that they feel genuinely sorry, okay, prevents you from responding with overwhelming frustration. Another way to prevent amygdala hijacking is to diffuse away. Okay. Breathing deeply or focusing on a pleasant image helps you prevent your amygdala from taking control and causing an emotional reaction. Take six seconds. Count to 10. Okay, over time you change the way your brain responds to these emotional triggers. You prevent the amygdala from hijacking your brain. Rewiring your brain in this way, think carefully about the triggering situation after you tame your emotional reaction. So you may, when you start out in these practices, have an emotional reaction. You may not be able to do anything about it. But think about it after the event. Think carefully about what triggered the situation when you've calmed down. Identify that trigger and then determine a more appropriate response to use the next time something similar triggers. So thinking about the coffee that spilt on the new tablecloth, that was the actual event that triggered it. However, it was one of your children and it was their actions that caused you to respond inappropriately. So the next trigger is not necessarily going to be the same thing, coffee on fresh tablecloth, but it's going to be something else. And if you can realize that the trigger was the behavior of your child, the next time something goes wrong, you may be able to catch yourself or certainly limit the reaction that you have to the child's behavior. And you can think about this in virtually any part of your job. So identify triggers and determine a more appropriate response to use the next time. And it's very important to determine in advance what the appropriate response will be or should be or could be. <clears throat> Your amygdala learns from past experiences, allowing you to change the way in which you react to a similar situation in the future. It's the wonderful thing about the body, it learns. Okay, so let's have a look at a three-step breathing space. This is a technique that gives us a chance to step out of autopilot and see what is really going on. It allows a moment to pause when thoughts are threatening to spiral and provides room for a little reminder that every moment, good or bad, will come to pass. The best thing about it is, is that it can be done sitting down, standing up, jogging, wherever and whenever you like. So imagine the shape of an hourglass for this exercise. Okay. Wide at the top, narrow in the middle, wide at the bottom. Okay. The three steps follow that same pattern when focusing your awareness. Okay, so step one is becoming aware of what's going on now. That's a wide awareness. <coughs> Excuse me. Close your eyes if you're in a place where this is possible. Okay, and ask yourself these three questions. 
what am I thinking right now? Okay, so this could look like um, I need to remember to call my spouse. Uh, I need to book a table for tonight. But what if I can't leave work on time? What if I'm running late? You know, these are some of the things that are going to cause us stress. Uh, how am I going to clean this tablecloth that's got coffee stains all over it? What are you thinking about right now? How am I feeling right now? Okay, what do you think? Stressed, excited, angry, angry that the kids ruined the the tablecloth. You have to wash it again and try and get it all nice and neat and clean. Are you excited? Are you calm? Are you afraid? What physical sensations do you experience in your body right now as well? And with different emotions, we experience different sensations in our body. Notice these. Where are they? How strong are they? Do they ring along or do they pulse? When under pressure and stress, you know, quite often I, I notice maybe my stomach knots up. Um, you may notice that you get a tick on the side of your head. <clears throat> and equally, when, when you're excited or anxious about something, um, you know, think about doing a presentation to a crowd of people, you know, you, you can quite often feel a bit jittery. Your pulse uh, seems to be beating a, a, a lot quicker. So in this step, what you're doing is you're opening your awareness to yourself, where you are right now and how you're feeling. So step one, it becomes aware of what is going on right now. Take about a minute to actually do that. Step two is become aware of your breath. Okay, spend a minute on this. So direct your full attention towards your breath by focusing on the physical sensations caused by breathing. So this is a very narrow field of focus. You're focusing just on your breath. And that's where the hourglass comes from, yeah? Focus on the movement of your stomach. Expanding out on each breath and contracting in on each breath. This is a way to bring your attention to the present moment. If you feel your mind is wondering, that's okay, just bring it back again to your breath and your belly. Okay. And remember that your mind is like your muscles. The more you exercise them at the gym, the better you get at lifting heavier weights. And meditation is gym for the mind. And that's why we're going to have a look at uh, some meditation exercises in a couple of minutes. The more you do it, the stronger and better your mind becomes at focusing. So that's why it's so important to practice meditation so that you can become aware of your breath, which once you've been in a situation where you need to understand what's going on now, I am angry, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, uh, whatever it is, become aware of your breath. How do you become aware of your breath? Well, you need to practice this. And that is what mindfulness and meditation do. Okay, because what you want to do with through your breath is bring your mind back to the present. Then, having spent a minute on that, expand your awareness. And here we are, once again, going wide, okay? So from the narrow focus of the breath to the wide expanse of what is happening. You know, imagine your body, and with each breath, picture the air filling up your lungs and circulating through your arteries and into your veins, all the way to your fingertips and down to your toes. Okay, when you're ready to bring the practice to a close, keep expanding your awareness outwards beyond your body. Notice your surroundings. Become aware of the temperature. How hot is it? How cold is it? What can you smell? What can you hear? What can you see? Okay, and this allows you to feel part of the present. You have a place in the world. You are here. You are strong and ready to take on of the day. Okay. So, your three step breathing space, and remember the hourglass, wide attention, narrow focus, wide awareness. But essentially, this is your reset button. Okay. <clears throat> this helps you to cut the amygdala hijack 
and return to a state of focus, calm, clarity, your rational brain engages, you're more able to make effective decisions, to take skillful action. So whenever you notice you're overwhelmed or the mind becomes scattered, take a mindful pause to become grounded and fully present. So let's have a look now very quickly at how mindfulness changes the brain. People who practice meditation regularly report feeling less stressed and more emotionally balanced. According to neuroscientists, as you continue to meditate, your brain physically changes, even though you're not aware of it reshaping itself. Neuroscience is also looking to understand why meditation is effective for managing stress using brain imaging techniques. These neuroscientists have observed changes in the threat system of the brain. The response kicks off in the amygdala, the part of the brain responsible for triggering fear. People who suffer from chronic anxiety, as you mentioned earlier, have a more reactive amygdala, and this leaves them feeling threatened far more of the time. Just to share a story with you. One even old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is negativity. It's anger, sadness, stress, contempt, disgust, fear, embarrassment, guilt, shame, and hate. The other is positivity. It's joy, gratitude, kindness, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and above all, love. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one that you feed. Good. Okay. So this brings us on to the next session, staying energized and resilient under pressure. <clears throat> and this is my journey with mindfulness. Uh, as you can see, um, I kind of, when I started out, it was a bit of a rough journey, um, much like riding a horse. I think I spent more time on the ground and in the dirt than anywhere else. So you know, basically what I'm saying is that mindfulness is not necessarily the easiest thing to start, um, but like getting back on the horse, it requires discipline, it requires courage, um, but it's worthwhile because what happens is that eventually you will master the mind and be able to sit in the saddle, be cool, be calm, and be in control. And as you progress, so you will be able to do some quite magnificent things with your mind. You will become the master. <coughs> How I got into meditation, well, that was a long story of almost working in an impossibly bad organization. My blood pressure was 182 over 122, uh, and I had constant nosebleeds. I was so stressed. Um, I was on blood pressure medication, but it wasn't working. Uh, they had a well-being department uh, in the organization where I was working, but uh, they had absolutely no idea on, on how to do anything about it. Um, and I realized I had no alternative but to look after my own health. So I started talking to people and researching uh, stress management, and this was the beginning of my salvation. A year later, my blood pressure was perfectly normal, and I was off the meds. Okay, but it was not an easy journey for me. And every person is going to have their own journey. So let's have a look at some definitions of mindfulness. And the reason I'm giving these definitions is because there are so many different definitions of mindfulness that you're going to run into. The first one is a form of exercise to cultivate compassion and awareness. Some of the qualities seen as the foundation to a healthy and happy life. A disciplined practice of specific techniques that helps build the mind muscle over time. Another definition, a basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we're doing and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. And now I highlighted two words 
that are the same and that's aware and awareness okay another um definition and this is from uh university of california berkeley mindfulness means maintaining a moment by moment awareness of our thoughts feelings body sensations and surrounding environment through a gentle nurturing lens a little bit later on we're going to have another look um, i'll look at another definition uh, mindfulness also involves acceptance meaning that we pay attention to our thoughts and feelings without judging them without believing for instance that there's a right or a wrong way to think or feel in a given moment when we practice mindfulness our thoughts tune into what we're sensing in the present moment rather than rehashing the past or imagining the future okay let's do a little experiment on the topic of mindfulness and why mindfulness so what I want you to do is sit with your eyes open allow your mind to settle and to clear and I do not want you to think of anything especially I do not want you to think of a pink elephant pink elephant still there okay so it just shows how difficult it is to control the mind and the mind has a mind of its own most of the time but through mindfulness we can start to take better control of our mind so what what's happening our minds are essentially designed to be busy uh, you generate more electro impulses in your brain in one day then all the mobile phones on the planet put together. And that comes from uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who is a neuroscientist. <clears throat> Excuse me again. And um, yeah, when you consider that there are almost 5 billion phones um, on this planet uh, and everybody's making phone calls and sending texts and emails and watching videos and oh my goodness me. That is a lot of activity. Yeah. And that is just how much is going on in your head. So if you think BT and Vodacom and Virgin and Sky are busy, tell you what, they've got nothing on you. What's happening in your mind? So our minds are essentially designed to be busy. Yep. So researchers have found out that this wonderful pattern making machine of ours serves us well for much of the time but quite often it's just not really helpful and in actual fact it just kind of wanders off on its own steam and research from harvard university shows that the mind wanders for about 47 percent of our waking hours so imagine if we could get it to not wander for that 47 percent imagine how productive we'd be what we'd be able to do and achieve but unfortunately, it just decides to disappear on its own little mission in its own cloud 47% of the time. But we may not be able to take it completely beyond 47% of our waking hours, but maybe we could just take it to 40%. Imagine the difference in your waking hours, what you'd be able to achieve, what you'd be able to do. So I suppose in a way, you know, the um, like a wild horse or a puppy on a lead for the first time, it, you know, the mind wanders wild and free, it's untamed. But like a wild horse or a puppy, with time and patience, we can get it under control. Okay. So let's have a look now. What does meditation mean to you? Okay. 
So, this is what we normally come to when people think of meditation. These are some of the reactions I've had. You know, some people think that it belongs to a sect of uh, brightly colored people throwing incense around the place. Uh, others think oh, it's only for those people in gym outfits who sit on mats and cross their legs in impossible positions and hold their arms in uncomfortable places. Uh, others say, no, it's, it's the preserve of um, Buddhist monks uh, who have to go out into nature, shave their heads and wear orange robes. Others think it belongs to hippies and, um, you know, they reminisce about the good old days. Uh, yet others say that, yes, it's uh, something that uh, can only be done outdoors in absolutely impossible locations and with uh, the body contorted into uncomfortable stances. So it's got lots of different meanings to lots of different people. Okay. Some people think, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 it's great. You know, help yourself, but this is really not for me. I can't meditate. I don't have the time. I don't have the inclination. Okay. But it's worth the effort. Essentially, our minds don't like doing what we tell them. And that's why if we say, don't think of the pink elephant, then the pink elephant is what appears. So it's not easy to control our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, or memories from the past, or speculation about the future. What's going to happen tomorrow? Will it be raining? Will it be sunny? Will my shares go up? Will they go down? Will I have a job? Okay. So what happens is that our minds tend to operate in certain parameters. And our minds really, really do love to be in another time zone. They ruminate on the past, okay, we're forever dredging up, oh, if only, or if it hadn't been for this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We even talk about that when we're talking about sports, the hockey game, the basketball game, et cetera, et cetera. If she hadn't passed this way or had passed to that person, and so we ruminate on things that we can have absolutely no influence over. We can't go back in time. That's something that's happened. Yet we love to speculate on it. If Boris hadn't put the bus with NHS money, 350 pounds extra, whoa, what would have happened? And we also speculate and worry about the future. Will we or won't we Brexit? Will we remain? Will we have another vote? Whoa, what will the people say? What about the EU elections? Who's going to win? What about Nigel Farage? Will somebody throw another milkshake at him? And of course, we hold our, really hold on to our to-do list, you know, mulling over all the things that we need to do. I need to go shopping. I need to get some more food for the kids. I need to get juggling apples for my little ones, those types of things. And so often we are on autopilot. It's just the same thing that we do every single day. It's the same journey into work. We trudge the same path. We catch the same train, the same bus. Some of us are lucky enough to catch the same plane, but essentially it's on autopilot. And of course we get caught up in our impulses and spend a lot of time reacting. Okay. All of this not very helpful. I'm not gonna bring you to another definition of mindfulness. And this is from John Kabat-Zinn. And he was the first Western scientist in the early 80s to distill the psychology of mindfulness from old age Buddhist practices and teach them in his, to his Boston medical patients. Attending to an experience with full awareness and without judgment, mentally, you take a step back from your stream of thoughts and sensations to gain a wider perspective on your thinking. With practice, you learn to observe the contents of your mind calmly in a non-reactive way. You learn to accept a thought for what it is. And it is just a thought. He said mindfulness 
means paying attention to what's happening in the present moment in the mind, in the body, and the external environment with an attitude of curiosity and kindness before making a judgment. Okay. Now, of course, each person is going to have a different practice. Okay. Quite often, the practices can be guided. How long do they last? Well, I started off on two minutes a day. It's quite literally, that's all I could do before the horse threw me off and I landed on the ground and I couldn't get back on the horse that day. So my mind was all over the place, absolutely all over the place. The thing is, I stuck at it, though. Two minutes a day for several weeks, then became three minutes a day, and then four minutes a day. And now it is substantially longer every day. Some people meditate for 10 minutes every day, and that's great. Some people do it for an hour, four times a week, and that for them, it works. So essentially, mindfulness is a way of training the brain. Like any other training, such as going to gym to build up your muscles, you need to do it regularly to see a positive and lasting change. If you decide you do want to go on to develop a mindful practice, the usual way is to take a course to help you learn more about it, be introduced to some of the techniques, and then immerse yourself and practice them regularly so they become embedded. Practice them regularly so they become embedded. Practice, practice, practice. The idea is that with time, you build a personal practice, which is right for you. Do what works best for you. Make it yours so you can embed it in your life. Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, was a great believer in meditation. And he said, it takes great discipline. It's not a quick fix. So it does. It takes time, commitment, energy, and practice. And it's not a magic wand. Okay, it doesn't just make the tough stuff disappear. It does help you to interact with the tough stuff more effectively, though. You can then choose to switch from the busyness of the doing mode in which we spend so much of our life to simply being mindful. So mindfulness is a tool for developing a highly functional and effective mind. It's great for managing attention, improving awareness, and it sharpens focus and clarity. What meditation does is it activates the insula, which is part of the brain that enables you to develop awareness of bodily sensations and emotions. So it's the part of the brain that enables you to develop awareness, the insula. The ability to see the emotion the moment it arises. The mind acquires depth, ability. See the anxiousness objectively rather than experiencing it. When we practice mindfulness regularly, we become aware of our habitual thoughts and behaviors. We become familiar with our breathing and how it changes under stress. We're in tune with our body and its varying physical sensations. Turning the lens of awareness into what is happening during a reaction will, by its very nature, change the reaction. Okay. When we bring an attitude of acknowledgement and curiosity to what is happening to us, to our experiences, we are immediately taking a different stance. We are not reacting. We are witnessing what is unfolding as we are observing rather than being caught up in the experience. This immediately has a dampening effect on any emotional charge. This moment of conscious awareness removes us from reacting unconsciously, thereby creating an opportunity for us to make a choice. 
When we regularly practice letting go of thoughts and returning to a point of focus, such as the breath, we are strengthening these neural pathways and creating a body memory. For this is what we do with sticky thoughts. Thus, when we bring awareness to our anxious thoughts arising during a stress, using breath will become a familiar feeling. Letting go and bringing ourselves back again and again prevents us from getting stuck in rumination. Creating a pause in this way is creating an opportunity for the higher areas of the brain to contextualize the perceived threat, gather more information from the senses, memories and experiences, and thereby deactivate our emergency signals. <coughs> it is really the journey that is a process. It is a journey that requires patience as well as huge dollops of gentleness and kindness towards yourself. Let go of any goals to be a particular way and simply have the intention to practice as best you can, when you can. That is all you can ask of yourself. Practice as best you can and when you can. We are given that instruction, follow the breath. And because of how we've grown up, most of us will set out to get that right. It's very natural to think that there's a right way and a wrong way of doing things. So when you're given an instruction in meditation such as follow the breath, it's only natural to think that there's a right way of doing this. You can keep your breath within the bandwidth indicated by the shading inside the arrow when you're doing it right. And whenever your attention wanders outside the bandwidth, then you're getting it wrong. But here's what actually happens to almost everyone when they first engage in the practice of meditation. Your attention wanders off on a journey of its own. Just much like that wild horse or that new puppy, okay, off on their own mission. So you forget and then you remember your intention. Ah, you set out to meditate and pay attention to your breath. Very soon you forget to do that. You lose your intention and use that time for a few quiet moments to do a bit of planning. You review your to-do list, you look back in the past, um, and then you come back. Then you start dreaming again. What if I won the lottery? What would I spend the money on? And then you come back to your bed. Over and over you forget, your mind wanders off, the puppy strays. And you remember your intention to meditate and you come back to your breath. There's distraction. You set out to pay attention to your breath, but very soon something else comes along to take our attention. Maybe there's some sort of noise coming from outside the room. Somebody's, I don't know, sweeping the hallway or you can hear an alarm going off and that takes your attention. And then you start to think about what if uh, it wasn't for the alarm. And then you remember you bring your mind back. Sometimes you forget and remember the attitude. Your mind keeps wandering and you begin to get annoyed with yourself. Come on, this isn't rocket science. How difficult can this possibly be? Just follow the breath. Why can't I do something as simple as that? Then you remember the attitude and you come back with a kinder approach. Well, yeah, minds wander. That's fine. Allow it to wander. And acknowledge that it has wandered, but bring it back to your breath. Okay, it has the really great thing. Each time you forget is another opportunity to remember. And each time you remember, it's as if you're laying down tiny deposits in the neural pathways connected with sustained intention, sustained attention, and an attitude of kindness and curiosity. People often say, oh, I can't meditate, I've tried it, but oh, I can't empty my mind, I've got pink elephants storming through all the time, I can't stop them, there's herds of them. I hope you'll see now that this really isn't the point. The point is simply to notice and come back. Notice and come back over and over and over. 
This is a discipline. I'm just going to do a quick 10 minute mindfulness of the body and breath practice with you now. Okay. This is just a very short example of mindfulness, of training the brain. Okay. But like every other training, such as going to gym to build up your muscles, you need to do it regularly to see a positive and lasting change. If you decide you do want to go on to develop a mindfulness practice, the usual way is to take a course to help you learn more about it, to be introduced to some of the techniques and then immerse yourself and practice them regularly so they become embedded. And that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be putting up lots of courses and lots of practices and lots of help so that you can immerse yourself and practice regularly so that it becomes embedded. The idea is that with time, you build a personal practice which is right for you. Do what works best for you. Make it yours. You own it. Embed it in your life. And remember what I said earlier, it's not a quick fix. It takes time, commitment, energy, practice. It's not a magic wand. It doesn't make the tough stuff disappear, nor it does help you interact with it effectively. But it does help you to interact with the tough stuff more effectively. You can then choose to switch from the business of the doing mode to simply being mindful. So what I'd like you to do now is find a relaxed, comfortable position. You could be seated on a chair or on the floor or on a cushion. Keep your back upright if you can, but don't make it too tight. Rest your hands wherever they are comfortable. It may be in your lap. It may be on your knees. It may be on the floor. Try the tongue on the roof of your mouth. Or wherever it's comfortable. Notice and relax your body. Try to notice the shape of your body, its weight. Let yourself relax become curious about your body seated here, the sensations your body experiences, the touch, the connection with the floor or the chair. Relax any areas of tightness or tension. Just breathe. Tune into your breath. Feel the natural flow of breath in and you don't need to do anything with your breath. Not long, not short, just natural breathing. Notice where you feel your breath on your body. It might be in your abdomen. It might be in your chest or your throat or in your nostrils. See if you can feel the sensation of one breath at a time. When one breath ends, the next breath begins. Now, as you do this, you might notice that your mind may start to wander. You may start thinking about other things. If this happens, it is not a problem. It's very natural. Just notice that your mind has wandered. You can say thinking or wondering in your head softly and then gently redirect your attention right back to your breathing. Stay here for five to seven minutes. Notice your breath in silence. From time to time, you'll get lost in thought, then return to your breath.
After a few minutes, once again, notice your body, your whole body seated here. Let yourself relax even more deeply. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sound a chime. At the beginning of the chime, I want you to tune into your breath. Feel the natural flow in and out. And we'll focus on the breath. Catch the mind wandering and return it to the breath again and again and again. And we'll do this for five minutes from the start of the chime. Just tune into your breath. Relax any areas of tightness or tension. Just breathe. Feel the natural flow of breath in and out. don't need to do anything to your breath. Notice where you feel your breath in your body. You may notice that your mind may start to wander. You may start thinking about other things. It's not a problem. It's natural. Gently redirect your attention back to your breathing. Just notice your breath in and out.
once again notice your body, your whole body seated here. Let yourself relax even more deeply. And importantly, what I want you to do now is to offer yourself some appreciation for doing this practice today. I'd like to say thank you all very much for joining me. And please do try and join me later for some further exercises. and start your mind from this journey tomorrow. Thank you everybody and farewell.